In this clarification today, let's compare gel filtration, also called size exclusion chromatography, with gel electrophoresis. Gel filtration uses a very large column and is very useful as a laboratory technique for purification of proteins in large quantities. Gel electrophoresis, on the other hand, is more useful for analytical separation of proteins. The issue with these two techniques that gets the students confused is that here, in gel electrophoresis, the larger proteins migrate very slowly, whereas in gel filtration, size or exclusion chromatography, uh, the larger proteins migrate very fast and they have a very short retention time. Let's clarify why. In this illustration here, uh, this, the circle represented the beads, the matrix, the stationary phase, where the pores are. And we load here a sample composed of two proteins in this case, with a buffer, and the protein, uh, larger protein is depicted as blue, and the smaller protein is de depicted as red. So the pores uh, in, this, uh, in the beads allow the small protein to enter, and because of the pore size, they exclude the larger proteins. So uh, the matrix has a certain size limit or a number of pores with a smaller size than pores with larger size. So what happens then is that the larger proteins having, not in, having access to the beads, they just migrate in between the beads. So they sneak in and they keep coming down to the column. So as you load after some time, we see that the larger proteins are already gaining in speed as compared to the smaller protein. Because the smaller protein goes inside of the beads and spend time there. And it's important to, to remember that this is not a binding. This is not like ion exchange chromatography or like affinity chromatography. There's no binding here. Just they spend some time, they waste time uh, wander around inside of the beads and therefore they come out late. So after a long time what we're going to see that the small proteins are still wandering around and get inside of the beads and the larger proteins are already coming out of the column. So it's very clear that the larger proteins come first because they do not penetrate or they penetrate in a, in a less uh, extent in the pores because there are not enough pores with their size. Uh, the circle that we depicted there looks like perfect, but the, the beads are not perfect and they, if you look at them microscopically, you're going to see that they have tunnels, they have opens uh, inside of the beads. So that's where the small protein penetrates and if, for example, a small protein here could do a thing like that and spend the time around uh, without moving downwards in the column, they are spend a lot of time inside of the beads. Whereas the larger protein has no choice, it has to go sneak in in between beads and move down the road because there is no place for them to go inside of the gel. Uh, just brought one example from the lab, some experiment that I did earlier, uh, a chromatogram, which it, this is what we get from those separation gel filtration columns and then out of these columns. We have here on the left the detector response. In the case of proteins, we use uh, UV detection and you set the detector at 280 nanometers because we expect that at least one tryptophan is going to be there in this protein and therefore they are going to be absorbing light at that particular wavelength. It's a generic one that you use for all proteins 208. And as the proteins come out, we measure their retention time, how long it takes for them to come out of the column. So here's what we see. Uh, they come out, the detector detected and generates a peak and go on and on. Okay, so we can also load uh, each protein at a time so that we know exactly the retention time, what the time this protein comes out. And by doing that, we can identify each of these peaks. And the first peak here is with a blue dextran, 2,000 kilodaltons, very large molecule. 
cannot penetrate this, the, any of the pores in this particular column. So what blue dust run does is basically flush through in between the beads and never spend any time inside of the beads. Another marker, another uh, protein that's normally used to calibrate the gel filtration column is bovine seroalbumin, 66 kilodalt, a larger protein. Therefore, being large encounters less uh, space inside of the beads, less tunnels with their own uh, size that they could penetrate there and it moves a little bit fast. Of albumin is 42.7. And all proteins here are proteins that are used normally to calibrate gel filtration columns. The next one is chymotrypsinogen, 25 kilodalt. And finally, ribonuclease A, 13.7 kilodalt. So let's say that your protein is 20 kilodalt. So what, where are you going to expect your protein to migrate? So you're going to expect your protein to have uh, retention time in between ribonuclease A and the chymotrypsinogen uh, because they have the molecular weight after and before that. If you have a protein of 31 kilodalt, we expect that the protein that probably is going to come out in a retention time in between of albumin and the chymotrypsinogen. So that's how the gel filtration column works with the smaller protein that come later and the larger protein that come first. Okay, so that's a very common technique used in the lab uh, for purification of large quantities of proteins. It's not an analytical technique, it's more used as for the preparation of proteins, large scale preparation of proteins. Gel electrophoresis is more an analytical technique. Uh, we don't use it much. Sometimes we use it for a small preparation of protein, isolation of proteins, but not for larger scale. We, for larger scale, use monocule and the other columns and so on. Uh, uh, the gel electrophoresis is analytical, so you want to separate the proteins. In SDS page, what we do is that we denature the protein, and then we make the protein interact with the SDS. Uh, the reason for the nature of the protein is because all those amino acids that we talk in class that they have charge such as lysine, arginine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, they can be on the surface of the proteins in different ways according to the conformation of the protein, right? So different proteins would have a different charge on the surface and it would make a complication because then we have the charge of the surface and the molecular of the protein. In SDS page, as opposed to native page, that's a separate one, in SDS page, what we do is that we destroy this interaction by denaturing the protein, and then we make them react with SDS so that all proteins become negative with the same charge rate. So if, if you were to separate a mixture of proteins and put that in a, a, a gel, uh, in, a, in a space with the difference of potential, uh, they would all migrate in the same speed. So we need a barrier to make it then move at a different speed. And that barrier is the gel, is the uh, polyacrylamide gel. So the gel is not a solid, is not a liquid, is a gel, and it has openness, has tunnels inside. If you were to look at the microscope level at the gel seen from the top, we are going to see these tunnels and the different size of the diameter of those tunnels, okay? So those are the tunnels that form the gel when you prepare the gel either in the lab or if you purchase the gel already made. This an uh, electron micrograph suggests that polyacrylamide gels have indeed this labyrinth of tunnels and this is very important because uh, the smaller proteins are going to pass through this labyrinth more easily than the, the larger proteins because of the size of the, the, the diameter of those uh, uh, tunnels. Uh, the number of uh, uh, tunnels with smaller diameter is larger than the number of uh, tunnels with the larger diameter. Think about that like a, a group of cars in a traffic jam and this motorcycle passing through us 
and they're going moving forward, right? It's because they have a narrow space there that for them is enough as uh, a way to pass and to move forward, uh, whereas the cars are waiting for a larger space to move. So cars move slower, slower, and the motorcycle move faster in a traffic jam situation. Basically, that's what we have in here. So this is one example from the lab also, ATRA AOX2 is an enzyme. Probably we are going to talk about this enzyme in class later. So here's again his same gel, and we see the markers here on the left, recombinant enzyme on the right. So what we note from the gel, if we look at the numbers from the bottle, we see 6.5 kilo dial, the protein in their marker at 6.5, and another marker on the top of the gel of 200 kilo dial. So what it means 6.5 went to the bottom of the gel? It migrates so fast that it went all, all the way down. It's because a small protein of 6.5 kilo dial, even consider peptide more than a protein, such a small thing, uh, and then it moves through the stenos very quickly. As opposed to 200K, 200 kilo dials is a larger protein, didn't find enough tunnels, didn't find enough passage that was big enough for that protein to move. And you load that protein and it moves so slowly that when you end the gel, it was uh, only one little bit of space that it gained in terms of moving down from the gel. So basically that's what happens in uh, gel electrophoresis, where the larger proteins migrate so slowly and the uh, smaller protein mi migrate very quickly. I hope that's crystal clear now that you know the gel filtration. Uh, proteins that are very large come first, they have a shorter retention time. Proteins that are very small come slowly out of the column and they have, as a consequence, a longer retention time. By contrast, in gel electrophoresis, uh, the proteins that are very large have a slow, slow migration, so they keep it up in the on the top of the gel, whereas the proteins that are small migrate very fast and they come l more uh, rapidly to the bottom of the gel. So the lower in the gel, the smaller the molecular weight of the protein in gel electrophoresis.